Welcome to Connect with Skip Heitzig, and you are in for a special message today. Christmas Through the Ages is the title. This is Scott Dooley. Glad you've joined us today. Christmas stands as one of the major holidays within the church. On Christmas Day, we celebrate the Incarnation, God coming to earth in human form through the person of Jesus of Nazareth. In this teaching, Skip Heitzig reflects on the unique aspects of Jesus' birth, looking to Scripture to find where Christmas began and why. Let's begin as we join Skip. You know, one source says that of all the Christmas songs that are sung this time of the year, three of them stand out as being the most popular Christmas carols of all. And they are in this order, Joy to the World, The First Noel, and Silent Night. Great songs, right? All great songs. However, I do have a little something against each one. Let me explain. Um, Joy to the World. It's an awesome song. It's one of my favorite all-time songs, actually. It was written by Isaac Watts in the 1700s. But did you know that when he wrote Joy to the World, it has nothing to do with Christmas whatsoever? He wrote it about the second coming of Jesus rather than the first. And if you go through the lyrics, you'll spot that. You go, oh, I see about Jesus ruling and reigning over the earth, which the Bible says will be a second coming. And that's what he had in mind, and that's what he wrote it for. But that's okay. It's, it's appropriate to sing joy to the world at this time of the year because Jesus came, and yet he promised he is coming again. So it's absolutely appropriate to do that. The second song is the first Noel. Again, a stellar tune. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep. Here's the part that gets me. On a cold winter's night that was so what? Deep. So you picture shepherds hunkering down, 12-foot snow drifts. It's really cold outside. The only problem with that is Jesus was born in the Middle East, in Israel, and I've been there at all seasons of the year, and they don't have weather like that. And besides that, historians are actually telling us that Jesus probably was not born December 25th. I hate to burst your bubble, but most scholars will pinpoint the date somewhere between March and May where he was born. And think about it. If Caesar Augustus is demanding the whole world goes back to their city of origin for a census, a registration to take place, he's not going to do it in the worst part of the year. He's probably going to do it at a more favorable time of the year for travel. The next song, Silent Night, great song. Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm. Since when was the birth of any baby a silent night where all is calm? Bright, maybe, but not calm and not very silent. So they couldn't get a room. They had to be forced to a, a manger. And so the streets were packed full of people. The inns were packed full of people. It was noisy and boisterous out there, and a baby was being born inside. Great song, but not too accurate. Allow me to give you what I consider one of the great Christmas carols. It's not on the top three list, but it's one of my favorite. And I like it not because of the beat or the key that it's in or the memory that the song evokes, but I love it because of the theology that's in the song. And by the way, it was a song penned by a theologian. Charles Wesley, the brother of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote this song, Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all you nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic host proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Great theological truths in that song. But the second verse is even better. Listen to how much truth he packs into one verse. 
Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. I love those truths in that song. But there's a phrase in that song that I'm drawing your attention to. The phrase is, late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. I have two questions to pose to you this afternoon. Number one, where did Christmas begin? And number two, why did it happen then? Why 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem? To answer those two questions, I offer you two verses of Scripture, two passages of Scripture. One is found in the book of Romans, the first four verses of chapter 1, where Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, here's what I want you to listen to, which he promised before through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead the second is Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 and 5 where Paul adds this truth and when the fullness of the time had come God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So, where did Christmas begin exactly? Did it happen at the manger? Is that, was that the start of Christmas? Did it begin at the manger when Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Or did it start when the shepherds heard the angels announcing in the sky that something was happening in Bethlehem that they should go check out? Or did Christmas begin when the Magi showed up eventually in Bethlehem with those presents to give Christ? Or did Christmas begin earlier than that, say the book of Daniel, when he saw this great vision of a kingdom filling the entire earth ruled by one person called the Son of Man? Or maybe we could go back further. Did Christmas begin in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, where Isaiah in chapter 7 said, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Or perhaps two chapters later, that's when Christmas began. You know the passage. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of his father David, to order it and establish it, from this time forth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Incredible prophecy of Scripture. Is that when Christmas began? No, to answer the question where it began, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of the story, the, the beginning of the book of Genesis itself. Genesis opens up, you know the story. Um, God created stuff and he liked it. That's Genesis 1 and 2 right there. God made stuff and he looked at it and go, I like that, that's good. And then he makes something else go, that's good. And he makes something else, that's good. And he then created his crowning creation made in his image, the Bible says, humankind, man and woman. The glory of God manifested in these two people, obedient, sinless, in cooperation with their father. It was all very good, God said. Until we get to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is the uh-oh chapter. Because we discover that because there is free will, that first man and first woman decided to disobey God, not cooperate with him. 
estrange themselves from him, cooperate with this serpent in the story, this being we know as Satan, and because they listened to him and followed him, they in effect became children of the serpent, children of the devil. And they were so alienated from God, and God took it so seriously that he kicked them out of the garden and would not let them return. And so now we're reading that story, and we go, now what? Now what's God going to do? He gave mankind free will. This is what they did with it. Will God ever do anything to redeem and restore his fallen creation? We're left wondering until we get to chapter 3, verse 15 of the book of Genesis, and it's as if God says, yes, I have a plan. I'm going to do something about this. And Genesis 3.15 is called by theologians, I'm going to give you a fancy word to impress your friends and family with after church. Ready? Proto-evangelium. Just throw that around at dinner time. Proto-evangelium is a word that means first gospel. The first time the good news is mentioned or anticipated, the proto-evangelium is Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. What does that say? It says this, I will put enmity... God says to the serpent, to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you in the head, you will bruise him in the heel. Now, we don't quite know what that means yet, if we're there at that time that is given. All we know is there's going to be a conflict. That's what enmity means. There's going to be animosity or conflict between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve. How? Well, he goes on. Between your seed and her seed. Again, we don't exactly know what that means since seed is a word that can be either plural or singular. It can mean many or it can mean one. So we don't know what it means until the next phrase. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now listen, he, he will bruise you in the head. You will bruise him in the heel. So now we know that seed isn't many, it's one. There's a he in the story. There's a he that is anticipated, a him that is coming. So all we know is there's going to be a conflict and the conflict will then end when one comes to strike a fatal blow to the head, the authority of the serpent, Satan. And that he will receive a minor temporary wound, a bruise in the heel. So we keep reading the story because it's the offspring of the woman, it says. Well, that's everybody. Everybody's a, a son or daughter of Eve. But we keep reading the story and we discover that Cain kills Abel. Adam and Eve have another son called Seth. The story goes on where God, because the populations of the earth are so wicked at the time of Noah, that God destroys the entire world via a worldwide flood except for how many people? Eight people. Eight souls are spared. So we know that it's going to be someone from the lineage of Noah because those are the only people that will be left on the earth to repopulate it. We keep reading the story and we discover who that is. That one of the offspring of Noah is a guy by the name of Abraham. And God gives a promise to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis and chapter 22, verse 16 of Genesis. God says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless the world through your seed. Then the promise goes from Abraham to Abraham's second son, the first son of Sarah, by the name of Isaac, Genesis 26. Then the promise goes again to Isaac's second son by the name of Jacob in Genesis 28. And then that promise goes to Jacob's fourth son by the name of Judah in Genesis chapter 49. And we keep reading the story, and God makes a promise to David from the tribe of Judah that he will have a descendant who will sit upon the throne and rule the earth forever and ever and ever. So we have a line established from Adam to Seth 
to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Judah, to David. No wonder when we open up the New Testament to Matthew chapter 1, it begins by saying, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and it's traced all the way back. The line is traced and preserved all the way back. So it's the genealogy of that he, that him, the one who's going to crush the serpent's authority, preserved in history. By the way, Jesus Christ has three basic credentials that separate him from every other belief system. Number one, his impact on world history. Number two, his bodily resurrection from the dead. And number three, fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. Did you know that the prophets of old spoke in advance of Jesus' birth, life, death, and even resurrection. And when I talk about prophecy, I don't mean a good guess. I mean, uh, there are multiple contingencies um, that cannot be controlled or known about in advance, but these things are written in detail before they happen. All of that to authenticate that the Scripture, what we call the Bible, is different from other holy books. It is the Word of God. And the Word of God predicts the work of God through that one who is coming. So that's that Romans 1 passage I just mentioned. Concerning his son, whom he promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That's when Christmas began. Second question, why then? Of all the periods of human history, do you ever wonder why 2,000 years ago in the backwaters of the Roman Empire in a place called Bethlehem, why did God send his son there? Why not to Rome, at least, or Athens, some major town? Why then? Why there? Well, that second passage I mentioned to you, Galatians 4, Paul writes, And in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. He says it was the fullness of time. The word fullness is Play Roma, it means ripe, right, plump, full. Now, you might be scratching your head going, why was that the right time? I mean, I would think this would be the right time. Think of the technology we have today. Think of the technology that could help God out to get his message around the world. I mean, Bethlehem could have been a Facebook Live event. It could have been streamed in high-definition television on satellite around the globe in real time. Joseph could have done an Instagram story right there in the manger. The shepherds could have taken selfies with the angels. Hey, right there. Don't move. Got it. The magi could have tweeted out where the star is tonight and the next night and the next night. But Paul says... That was the fullness of the time. It was the ripe time, the right time, the full time. Why? Before I get to that, let me just tell you something. You can apply to your own life. God is never late. He's never early. He's never late. Now, sometimes you think he's late. It's just, you're just early. God, you could have done something. I gave you plenty of time. Where were you? If you would have just followed my instructions, this could have been avoided. But God is never late. When Jesus first comes on the scene, the first words out of Jesus' mouth, recorded by Mark, are these words. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is the time. You remember Solomon said, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So why was that the right time? Well, let me suggest to you it was the right time spiritually. You see, the Jews for centuries had been oppressed by oppressors. All the way back to the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Syrians, now the Romans. They were always crying out for a deliverer, but secular history has recorded that there was a messianic fervor, a fervency, a heightened expectation of deliverance 
at the time of Jesus, unlike other times in history. They were waiting. They were ready. No wonder when John the Baptist came on the scene, they said, they asked him, are you the one? Are you that guy? Are you that he who's going to fix all this? He said, no, I'm not the one. So it was the right time spiritually. Let me also suggest it was the right time culturally. You see, before Jesus' time, there was a guy named Alexander who thought he was really great. <laughs> Alexander had this crazy dream to make the whole world Greek. That was his dream. He, he wanted to Hellenize the world. He wanted to Greekize the world, wanted to give the world a common language and a common culture, his culture, the Greek culture. And he pretty much succeeded. It was said that you could travel from India to Britain and speak one common language, Greek. So there's a common language. Ideas can now spread freely. By the way, Greek, as far as my studies have taken me, is the most precise language to convey human thought that we have. So things are just being set up. It's the right time spiritually, culturally. And let me suggest also it was the right time politically. You see, the big hit on the block at that time, you know this, was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was at its very peak of strength at the time Jesus was born. What does that mean? Well, they had enforced something they called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. It was an enforced peace. They built um, roads, 250,000 miles of mostly paved roads. You can still see remains of them today. 250,000 miles of roads. And along the roads were posted soldiers to keep the peace so now you can have people traveling speedily on those roads and safely, because of the Pax Romana, spreading their exact ideas in a common language around the world. And when the fullness of the time had come, listen to the next verse, the next phrase. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Notice how we wrote that. He didn't say, and when, and when the time was right, Jesus was born. Though that's true, he was. But when the time was right, God sent forth his son. Now, the phrasing suggests preexistence. Suggests that he was somewhere else first to be sent forth from there to here. God sent forth his son. Now, that shouldn't surprise you. Even Jesus thought that way and spoke that way. When he stood before Pontius Pilate at his trial and Pilate was asking about truth, and he said, what is truth? Jesus said, for this reason, I came into the world to bear witness of the truth. Just also, as Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us what? A son is given. So let me spell it out. Jesus existed in the presence of God the Father, Jesus being the second member of the triune God, and at just the right perfect time in history, as seen fit by God, he sprung into action and sent forth his Son from his presence to ours, the incarnation. Why? Why go to all that trouble to have it predicted and the lineage to preserve the seed all the way down Paul tells us that in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, here it is, to redeem, to redeem. Redeem is a word from the slave market in antiquity. To redeem means to buy back. And it was used to go to a slave market and you would put down the redemption money, you put down the... Um, uh, hard, cold cash, and you would buy a slave for yourself, or you would pay the price to set the slave free. That was redemption, to buy back, to pay, to, to set a slave free. So Jesus came from heaven to earth to the slave market of sin and paid the price so we could be taken to his house and adopted as his sons. So listen to the whole verse, that in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You're not slaves anymore. You're sons and daughters of the living God. You've been bought with blood. The price has been paid. You are his because the seed has come to end the dominion of the serpent. So now, can you understand why I love that Christmas carol so much, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? That, that, one, that, one, that one phrase, that one verse that I quoted, that he is worshipped, praised, by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead, see? Hail, incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. As Skip Heitzig has said about Christmas, the night Jesus was born, an angel of the Lord invited all people to meet the newborn Savior, starting with the lowliest and most overlooked population, shepherds. This extraordinary invitation to the most ordinary people was a preview of the humble birth, life, and death of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you about a special resource we are offering in a book by Kay Arthur. Whether you have little or great prayer experience, you will discover practical insights to help you know how to pray, what to pray, and what to expect when you pray. In this important work, K. Arthur sheds light on the instructions Jesus gave to his disciples for the perfect pattern of meaningful prayer. This look at biblical prayer is refreshingly simple and exceedingly powerful, and it can transform the way anyone lives in praise. You can receive your copy of this book on prayer by Kay Arthur with a donation of $25 or more to this audio outreach. Simply call 1-800-922-1888 or click on Donate at connectwithskip.com. Thanks to those who support this ministry. Thanks for joining us on Connect with Skip Heitzig. We're connecting you to God's never-changing truth in ever-changing times.